And on uh, recording in progress, hold on. <laughs> Got it. All right. I'm the curator at the park, and I am very excited for our uh, program today. Before we get started, though, we do have an audience. Well, let me know that this is a, a hybrid lecture, so we have an audience in Zoom land. And I have a little housekeeping I have to do for that before we get started because we're recording. So this is for all of you. <clears throat> this session is being recorded for training and record keeping purposes. By participating in this session, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and use of this session. At any time, if you have a question or comment, feel free to place that in the chat box and we will respond to you as soon as possible. If you would like to ask your question or comment verbally, please note that by doing so, you are consenting to the recording, retention, and use of your statements recorded as part of this session. That said, if you have any um, questions for the speaker, um, we'll be taking them after his presentation and we're not gonna be turning on the microphone. So please just put all of your questions in the chat. All right. Thank you for that. Um, this is our next to last lecture for 2023. So I wanna thank all of you for coming out. Uh, our next, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what we have coming up afterward, but just so you know, our final lecture for the year will be on December 3rd, and that will be by uh, military historian Colin Zimmerman, who will be talking about camp life and during the 1776 Bucks County encampments. But for now, I am very happy that we are going to be talking about this book, uh, Washington's Marines, The Origins of the Corps and the American Revolution. Uh, I'm especially happy to be doing it today. As you all know, we are about a week away from not only Veterans Day, but also from Marine Corps birthday. And I think this is the perfect- Woo! <laughs> So with that, let me introduce our speaker. Major General Jason Q. Baum is a Marine with more than 30 years of service, an infantryman by trade. He has commanded at every level from platoon commander to commanding general in peacetime and war. Major General Baum also served in several key positions, including as strategic planner with the Joint Chiefs of Staff, director of the Marine Corps Expeditionary Warfare School, House Director, Marine Corps Office Legislative Affairs, U.S. House of Representatives, and Chief of Staff of the U.S. Naval Striking and Support Forces for NATO. Just a Marine. Just a, just a Marine, he says. <laughs> he has a bachelor's degree in marketing, a master's degree in military studies, and a master's degree in national security studies. He's written several articles for the Marine Corps Gazette and has won various writing awards from the Marine Corps Association. He's the author of um, From the Cold War to ISIL, One Marine's Journey, and this book, Washington's Marines, The Origin of the Corps and the American Revolution, 1775 to 1777. So with that, let me welcome our speaker, Major General Jason Bowman. All right, and good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's so great and a distinct honor for me to be here with you today. I, I cannot think of a better location to discuss this topic than right here at Washington Crossing Park. So thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your weekend to join us today. Thank you to the staff of Washington Crossing Park. Uh, once again, this hollowed ground, this special place to be able to share a little bit of history about the United States Marine Corps and our humble uh, origins. Because many of you are familiar with this photo and maybe even that quote from President Reagan. And many people are very familiar with the honorable service, the selfless sacrifice, and the war fighting prowess of today's United States Marines. But very few people know about the Corps' humble beginnings and how, like our brothers in the Continental Army, 
in the Navy and state and militia groups and privateers contributed to the winning of our nation's independence and the preservation of our freedom. Excuse me, I gotta coordinate myself here to make sure I'm getting all the slides advancing. Okay, it looks like it's working, Kathy. Good? All right, thank you. So the roots of the American Revolution can be traced back to the French and Indian War from 1756 to 63, in which England, France, and Spain vied for control of the North American continent. Wow, and so all the British and Americans prevailed, this victory and providing for the enduring defense of the American colonies came at a very high cost. The mother country thought it only right that the colonies bear their fair share of these costs, particularly since Americans were only paying about 1 20th of the taxes paid by those back in England. But the independently minded Americans pushed back on several imposed taxes, particularly when living without proper representation in the government. And although neither country sought a war, conflict was inevitable. The war began with a victory at Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, but this victory on land was only half the equation. Because America is a maritime nation with an extensive coastline and countless lakes, rivers, and canals that can be used to quickly move people and things. And America would need men who could fight on the sea as well as the land if we had any hope of defeating the world's most powerful armed force at this time. This became evident in mid-June 1775 for an event that author James Fidmore Cooper called the Lexington of the Sea, in which American patriots captured two British merchant vessels and a Royal Navy schooner named the Margareta in what became known as the Battle of Machias, or the Battle of the Margareta, during what would become the first naval engagement of the Revolutionary War. Four days later, Colonel William Prescott led approximately 1,600 Americans up Breed's Hill, not Bunker's Hill, but Breed's Hill, on the Charleston Peninsula, resulting in a British victory, but coming at a very high cost. That same day, George Washington assumed command of the Continental Army, holding the British under siege in Boston. The immediacy of this crisis in Boston caused the Continental Congress to first place its focus and efforts on standing up the Continental Army, but it would soon find a need for its own Navy and Marines. Not possessing either at the time, Congress leveraged a temporary stopgap in the use of privateers, or otherwise known as sanctioned pirates, in which private merchant vessels were converted into warships and used to capture British ships at sea. Privateers had some positive impact on capturing British supplies early in the war, but many were in the business for their own personal gain. Their actions were poorly coordinated with the ground forces and George Washington had no control over them. In fact, they actually became a drain on the resources that were needed to stand up the Army, Navy, and Marines. Washington quickly realized that the privateers alone were insufficient to blockade the British in Boston, being resupplied and reinforced. So out of necessity, he created his own Navy using soldiers to serve in the capacity of sailors and Marines. Colonel John Glover from Marblehead, Massachusetts provided Washington with his first ship, the Hana, named after Glover's wife that you see depicted in this painting. And although they, although they had some early successes, the challenges associated with building a pickup team like this soon came to the forefront. In fact, one of Washington's agents described the situation this way. And I quote, the people on board the brigantine Washington are in general discontent and have agreed to do no duty on board said vessels and say that they enlisted to serve in the army and not as Marines. Benedict Arnold also created a freshwater fleet on Lake Champlain to fight the Battle of Balfour Island in upstate New York. He had similar situations with his Marines that he used uh, as soldiers transitioned to fight as sailors and Marines. And he had this to say, 
quote, we had a wretched motley crew, the Marines, the refuse of every regiment and the seamen fewer than them with salt behind their ears. Recognizing these challenges, Congress was forced to act when it received an intelligence report of unarmed ships leaving England with supplies for the British in Quebec. On the 13th of October, Congress approved a plan to have George Washington secure two armed vessels from the New England colonies for use in capturing those British ships, making this the official birthday of the United States Navy, 13 October. So Washington had difficulty finding these ships in New England, thanks in part because the privateers being a lucrative uh, uh, business had subsumed all of those local ships. So he recommended that the Congress look further south. So five merchant vessels were purchased and converted into warships in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Navy now had its first fleet and it now needed an admiral to commander. And they selected this gentleman 57-year-old Aesop Hopkins. He was a sea captain from Providence, Rhode Island, who had served as a privateer during the French and Indian War. Now, Hopkins established the largest, largest one of their ships, the Alfred, depicted here as his flagship, and he assigned a young officer named John Paul Jones as the ship's first lieutenant. As the first fleet prepared to sail in January of 1776, it raised two flags. Congress approved the Grand Union flag that you see in the lower left as the official flag of the United Colonies on the 3rd of December, 1775. And Congressman Christopher Gatson of South Carolina and a member of the now expanded Marine Committee uh, on the Congress's uh, floor presented Jones with a flag of his own design, the famous Gatson flag that you see depicted here. And that occurred on the 20th of December, 1775. Although Congress had established a Navy, it failed to establish the Marines to serve beside it until another fateful event occurred. On November 2nd, 1775, the citizens of Passamaquoddy, Nova Scotia, fueled American hopes of Canada joining the struggle against England as a 14th American colony. When the Committee of Safety from Passamaquoddy petitioned Congress to allow its admission into the, I quote, the Association of North Americans for the Preservation of Their Rights and Liberties. Congress responded by commissioning the first Continental Marine three days later. And that is this gentleman you see depicted here, Samuel Nicholas. On November 5th, Samuel Nicholas became the first and therefore the senior ranking Marine officer when president of the Continental Congress, John Hancock, signed his commission. Now, many have mistakenly pointed to Nicholas over the years as being the first commandant of the Marine Corps, but that's actually not true because Congress did not bestow that title on Marines until 1798, well after the American Revolution. But 31-year-old Nicholas was a prominent figure in Philadelphia. He was born a Quaker and his father passed away when he was only seven. He attended the Academy of Philadelphia, which is now the University of Pennsylvania, and graduated at the age of 16, after which he became a merchant and owner of the Conestoga Wagon Tavern in downtown Philadelphia, it's thus starting a trend of Marines being affiliated with alcohol that still stands strong today. And those Marines in the audience know what I'm talking about. Okay, well, Nicholas was, would honorably serve as the senior Marine throughout the war from 1775 through 1783. And being the first Marine, Nicholas was also the first Marine recruiter. Because following the note at Passamaquoddy, Congress assigned a Marine committee to develop options for conducting a naval campaign to capture the key British naval base in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And as such, the Marine Committee that was planning how to make this campaign work and what resources would be needed for it, met on the second story room of this building you see here, the Tun Tavern, which has gone down in history as being the official birthplace of the United States Marine Corps. 
That's right, we were born in a bar. Yeah. So the, the committee presented its recommendation to the full Congress on the 9th of November. And the following day, Congress resolved, and I quote, that two battalions of Marines be raised, that they be distinguished by the names of the 1st and 2nd Battalion of American Marines, making November 10th the official birthday of the Marines. And for those who don't know, if you're anywhere near a bar or tavern this weekend, staying clear because the Marines are going to be hooting and hollering and having a good time. We still celebrate our birthday every year, regardless of where we are in the world. It's near and dear to our heart. So when Congress directed the establishment of these two battalions of Marines, they tasked George Washington with cherry picking soldiers out of the army that had previous seafaring experience. Washington, as you can imagine, balked at this idea because he was already shorthanded trying to keep the British under siege in Boston. Well, John Hancock acquiesced and he let Washington off the hook, but he's still determined to come up with a separate and distinct body of Marines for service with the fleet. So Congress directed Samuel Nicholas and other Marine officers to go out and recruit their own men. Rather than form two standing battalion of Marines though, Congress chose to organize the Marines in such a way that they could easily transition from service at sea with the fleet to operations ashore. By planning to establish 10 separate companies of 50 Marines each, one company of 50 Marines would be assigned to a single ship to serve as that ship's Marine detachment. And if needed to do operations ashore, they could consolidate several ship's detachments into a single battalion to fight as a cohesive unit. The term we use that today is task organized. So Nicholas led efforts to recruit five separate companies of Marines to man the first five ships of the fleet. And he took personal command of the Marine detachment on Hopkins flagship, the Alfred. A snapshot of Isaac Craig's Mardet on the ship Andrew Duria provides a pretty good profile of what a Continental Marine company looked like in 1775. Craig's company consisted of 40 Marines, few of which were born in America. They were mostly immigrants from Great Britain, Ireland, Holland, Switzerland, and Germany. All but one of them was enlisted from Philadelphia. Their average age was 25 and a half years old, with the youngest only being 18 and, and the oldest being 40. Average height was five foot six inches, with the shortest Marine only being five three and the tallest Marine being six foot. And they brought many skills to their unit. They consisted in this 40 of carpenters, masons, barbers, bakers, cabinet makers, coopers, jewelers, brass founders, tailors, butchers, painters, weavers, wood combers, millers, laborers, servants, and a single doctor. The American fleet set sail on its inaugural cruise on January 4th, 1776. And all the fleet consisted at this time of seven ships armed with 110 cannons, manned by 680 Marines and 234, excuse me, 680 sailors and 234 Marines. Hopkins received two sets of orders, which he was told, don't open until you go to sea. The first set of orders he opened up and what he found was it was just expectations of how the officers and men were supposed to comport themselves. But the second set of orders that he opened up identified several ambitious and quite frankly, unrealistic tasks. Hopkins was to immediately take his fleet, set course for the Chesapeake Bay and find, engage and defeat the British fleet that was located there. And if that was not enough, he was then supposed to continue on to the Carolinas where he was supposed to find, fix and defeat the British fleet located there. And if that were not enough, then he was supposed to shoot up to Rhode Island and defeat the British fleet there. Now think about this. 